Today, we're going to be talking about leadership, which is one of my favorite topics. My name is Michelle Alanis, and I am a pediatric occupational therapy, and I'm also the director of an outpatient clinic in Southern California, where we see pediatric patients of all ages. I oversee 27 amazing staff of OTs, PTs, speech therapists, and early interventionists. And to be honest, I was never really that interested in leadership. I thought as a clinician, I just want to treat my kids and help the families I work with. I thought that being a leader meant that I was going to hound people about their productivity and micromanage them, which maybe tells a little bit about the modeling I had of leadership up until that point. So I just wasn't that interested in it. But over time, I did move into leadership and I have found it to be such a fulfilling position. So I'm excited to share with you a little bit about leadership today. Let's start out by talking about what is a leader? Now that might seem like a silly question. I guess a leader is a person that's in charge, right? But actually the way I define leadership is much broader than that. People come to the table with little tiny glasses to see leadership. And I want you to broaden your view and understand that leadership truly is simply having influence. And everybody has influence on someone in their life. I want you to stop and think for a moment about someone that you have influence with. It might be a friend, it might be your parents, it might be a coworker or a colleague, another student. All of us have someone that we're influencing. I think that a true leader is someone who owns their influence and tries to be intentional about how they utilize that influence. Let me give you an example. I have a therapist that works with me and she's the leader of our social skills groups. We have a lot of different social skills groups. And so there's a lot of staff involved in that and she kind of heads it up. She coordinates everything. And I brought her into my office and I said, I need to talk to you about your leadership. And she was really surprised. She said, I'm not a leader, I'm just a therapist and I just run this program. And I had to explain to her, you truly are a leader. Look at all of these people that you influence on a daily basis. They're looking to you for mentorship, for ideas, for uh, direction. And what we need to talk about is the fact that you're not stewarding that influence in the most effective way. She was coming to work and she's a verbal processor. So she would just say whatever was on her mind. And sometimes that would really bring the team down. And then when she was excited about something, she would say whatever was on her mind and the team would go up. And so it was this up and down and up and down. And I was trying to help her to understand that she was bringing influence into that team and that she could be intentional about how she was influencing, about how she was using her own emotional regulation to help the other people that were in the room with her. And starting with that conversation, she was really e um, able to delve into leadership and start to take ownership of that. And it transformed the way that she ran this team of therapists. So then, if leadership is simply influence, you want to think about when you first start working, your first person that you're influencing is your clients, the families that you work with, the patients that you work with, you are a leader to them. And so as we go through and talk about what a leader looks like, you can consider how you're a leader in your current life and how you may be a leader when you get into the field. So we've talked about what a leader is. Let's talk about what a leader isn't. A leader is not the same thing as a manager. You might be a manager and a leader. You might be a leader and a manager, but they're not the same thing. A manager is someone who manages tasks. They're someone that has the checklist that makes sure that everything's getting done as it's supposed to. That is a conduit for information from the leader to the rest of the people. A leader, on the other hand, is someone who influences the team. It's someone who inspires the team, who has a vision and can rally other people around it. So just because you're a manager doesn't mean that you're a leader. Also, some people have that narrow viewpoint of leadership that says only extroverted, charismatic people can be leaders. And although it may be true that a lot of people in leadership are extroverts, there are plenty of examples of quiet leadership, people who are more introverted, not 
front of the stage, look at me, look at me kind of people, but who are having a huge influence on the group of people that they're leading. It's just that the approach might look a little bit different. Your leadership style might be different, but ultimately it doesn't matter if you're an extrovert or you're an introvert. Anyone can be a leader. It's a set of skills that you can learn. Now let's talk about the stages of leadership. John Maxwell has a really good framework for this where he lays out five stages of leadership. The first stage is positional leadership. This is what we commonly think of when we think of leadership, right? Like I have the position, I'm the boss, so I'm the leader. But positional leadership is just the entry point into leadership. It's just like the very basis basics of it. It's like the kindergarten level of leadership. It's when you get the job. So that is positional leadership. And if you think of someone that you've um, had as a boss before, that's leading from a place of positional leadership, what that looks like is someone who basically nobody likes. Nobody likes a boss. They talk about her behind their back. They roll their eyes when he walks away, but they do the, the bare minimum of what that person is asking them to do because they are the boss. That's positional leadership. And that's definitely not where you want to stay as a leader. You want to move yourself into that next level of leadership, which is permission leadership. Permission leadership is where people uh, trust you. People are inspired by you. People look up to you because you show them respect, because you've taken the time to get to know them. You've taken the time to connect with them, to build relationships with them. And therefore they are giving you permission to lead them. They want you to be their leader. And so that's a, a different level, right? From the positional. An example of that is when you have someone who you're working with who regularly checks in with you to see how's it going? Are, do you have the things you need for your job to do it well? Um, are the clients that you're seeing the kind of clients you really love working with? Do you need any extra education to be successful? That's someone who's building up a, perm a permission-based leadership. From there, you go into level three. Level three is production leadership. And I love this level because I love production. I'm the kind of person that's really driven by the to-do list and getting all those ta tasks checked off. So a productive a production leader is someone who is truly a change agent. This person is coming into the position and making things happen. They're improving things. They're getting stuff done and people trust them and look to them to give them vision for what the future is going to look like. And they're inspired by, by what they're seeing and they're rallying behind that person. That is what it looks like to be in a production leadership. Next, you move into people development. People development is where you are investing in helping the people around you to meet their full potential. You know, earlier I said I really wasn't interested in leadership because I thought that it meant that I was going to be micromanaging and looking over someone all of the time. What I didn't realize is that when I got into leadership, I would actually be able to help so many more people. I had thought, oh, I, I love my job because I'm helping these kids that I'm working with. I'm helping these families that I'm working with, and I don't want to stop doing that. But what I have found, once you get into the people development part of leadership, you are able to help so many more families because now instead of just that one-to-one -one client that I'm working with and I'm educating the parent and I'm helping that child, now I'm doing that same sort of thing, but I'm doing it with a therapist. And then that therapist is going to go and educate 20 more children and 20 more families. And then she's also going to mentor another therapist and he's going to go, um, you know, influence 20 more families. And so it's exponentially more, um, more powerful where I'm able to influence and help many, many more people, many, many more children than I was able to do when I was working just one-to-one -one with a client. That's the people development part of leadership. And that's where you're not threatened by someone that is rising up. You're not, you're not threatened by your rising stars. You're not threatened by someone that's better than you. In fact, I delight in it 
it when I see that someone is better than me at something because I want people to see their full potential. The main value that drives my leadership is that I really want to be able to help people see their full potential and then to fulfill their full potential. And that's exactly what I did as a clinician. I just get to do it now with the people that I get to lead. Now, the final level of leadership is the pinnacle leadership level. And that is where you have a sustainable contribution that is creating a legacy. I had a CEO that was over our company for 25 years. And he was so passionate about excellent clinical care, about taking care of clinicians and making sure that um, we were the number one priority because the clinicians were what made everything else happen. And he set a legacy for us because he consistently showed up year after year and he changed the culture in such a way that we were pursuing excellence. We were all rallied behind this one vision and um, going after that goal together. That's what pinnacle leadership looks like. So now we've talked about what leadership is and what it isn't. And we've talked about the five stages of leadership. Now I want to talk about something that may, may sound a little like woo woo um, to some of you, but stay with me. I want to talk about your values as a leader. Now, what does it mean to have a value? Your value is something that is true to you at your core. It's something you firmly believe. And when you're living your life consistent with your values, you feel lit up, you feel excited. So I think values very closely link, link to your strengths. Let's talk about some examples of values. Your core value may be relationship driven. Maybe you are lit up when you're in relationship with other people, when you're investing in relationships, when you're spending time on relationships and you believe at your core that relationships are the reason we're alive. That is a value for you. And that's something that's going to drive your style of leadership. Um, another value might be accomplishment. There's nothing wrong with success being your value. I said, I like to get a lot of things done. I like to achieve. It makes me feel alive when I'm achieving new and bigger goals. So that is a core value of mine. Another value you might hold is one of innovation. Maybe you're thrilled by novelty and creativity and you feel like, at the core of who you are, that innovation is what's going to improve and save this world. That's a value of yours, or maybe it's personal growth. Maybe your value is that everybody should be consistently um, investing in themselves and improving and improving and improving. Now, who cares what your value is? Well, let's just use that last one, personal growth, as an example. If that is a core value of yours, and then you're working with people who like to do the same thing over and over again, because that's the way it's always been done. They don't spend a lot of time keeping up to date on the latest literature. They don't go to a lot of continuing education courses. They aren't developing a lot of new programs. And your two core values are innovation and personal development you're gonna have a lot of friction with those people. That's not gonna work well with you. So by taking the time to really consider what's my, what are my core values, that will help you to find the right fit. It's important when you're looking for a job, it's important when you're considering, do I wanna be a leader in this um, organization? It really helps with that culture and that contextual fit. Also, knowing your values can help you to understand what motivates you, and it can also help you know your triggers. So for ex that previous example, if I'm working with people who don't value personal growth, growth and innovation, and that's my value, that's going to be a trigger for me. I'm going to get annoyed with them. I'm going to be frustrated with them. And by understanding, oh, it's that our values aren't aligning, that will help me to understand those triggers and hopefully avoid them. But it will also help me figure out what motivates me, what helps me to be happy at work, what gets me getting up every day and showing up um, and really investing in this position. It's because I'm, I'm living out my values. 
Knowing your values is also important because it helps you to articulate what you bring to the table. When you go into an interview and they say, what are your strengths? Well, a lot of those strengths are going to center around the things you value. So again, using the example of innovation and personal growth, if that is your value, you probably have a strength where you... Um, where you are invested in knowledge, where you are always coming up with new ideas, where you are creating new programs, where you are um, engaged with research. These are all strengths that you bring to the table and they relate back to your value. And finally, by understanding your values, it will help you define what your leadership style is going to be. So in summary, you want to, first of all, know what a leader is, which is just being someone of influence and seeing how you can expand that influence over time. You want to consider what level of leadership are you at? Are you at position? Are you at permission? Are you at production? Are you at people development or are you at the pinnacle? And finally, you want to identify what your core values are so that you can know what motivates you, what triggers you and what your strengths are, as well as what's going to be a good uh, culture fit. Now that we've covered the basics of leadership, I want to talk about how this plays out when you get into the workplace. So let's talk about the core elements that make people happy at their job. Because when you come into leadership, a big part of your role is creating a workplace environment where people are able to thrive. And these are known elements. There's research that tells us what makes people happy when they're at work. I'm not gonna go over every single piece of it, but let's just talk about the major ones. The first one is knowing what's expected of you at work. People feel happier when they have very clear expectations for um, what the boss wants them to do and when they're given regular feedback on how they're doing as well as regular praise when they're doing a good job. So you can think about that for yourself when you're going into the um, workforce and you're looking for a job. One question you might ask is, uh, how, uh, what are the expectations of this job? How regularly will I get feedback on how I'm doing? Um, and so that sets you up to get into a culture where they value setting clear expectations. And then when you become a leader, you can understand that one way that's going to make people feel comfortable is if you're very clear about what your expectations are. Another thing that contributes to job satisfaction is having the materials you need to do a good job. All of us have had that job where it's like, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to get this job done? I don't have what I need. You know, you're at a desk job and your keyboard is janky and your mouse isn't working that well. You're working with kids, but there's not enough toys. There's not enough space. There's not enough mats. You really need to have what you need in order to do your job well. And that might be materials and it might also be knowledge, making sure that when you go into a company that they invest in those things for their staff. And as a leader, of course, making sure that you're checking in with the people that you're leading on a regular basis. How's it going? Do you have what you need? What can make your job run more smoothly? And making sure that you're keeping that steady supply of materials and knowledge so they can be successful at their job. And finally, you want to think about relationships. Relationships truly are the key for many people feeling satisfied at work. They want to, first of all, believe in the company and the mission of the company, but the day-to-day -day influence on job satisfaction is, do I love the people I'm working with? We have a saying in my department where we do work we love with people we love. I want to make sure that I'm funneling opportunities to my therapist where they're doing the kind of work they love. They're working within their sweet spot, but also that they're enjoying the team that they're working with. So team cohesion is so important. And job satisfaction, satisfaction metrics show us that having someone that you consider a friend at work is a huge influence on whether or not you want to stay there or not.
Now, you might not be able to connect people so that they become best friends forever, but you can certainly contribute to building relationships among your team. And first of all, you can do it by building your own relationship with the people that you're working with, getting to know them, getting to understand what drives them, what are their values, um, what, what lights them up when they're working, what kind of clients do they love seeing, what's the new thing that they're learning about. So connecting with people in that way so that you become that positive influence day to day on people's life, but also creating opportunities for the team to spend time together and to know each other. Developing team cohesion is so important, but it's also not necessarily easy. Everybody's so busy and they're going off and they're doing their own thing. And you, it's your job to bring those people together and to have the conversation. What have you done this week that really lit you up? How did that go? And how can we do more of that? Having that conversation with everyone on the team together so that they start to understand, oh, I can, I can really, really rely on so-and-so with this kind of client or with this kind of knowledge or with this kind of task, because she says every week that those are the things that light her up. So we start to understand what the people on our team, what their strengths are and what lights them up, what they're passionate about. And that builds relationships and it helps us to really know the people that we're working with. It's also important that people feel like their opinions count. I know when I was new to leadership, I had a terrible tendency. Whenever someone would complain about something, I would try to just like explain it away and brush it under the rug and be like, yeah, 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 but... And it was really the worst thing I could have done. Because when you do that, people feel like they're not being heard. And then they just want to talk about it more and um, and go even deeper in it. And so it really is key that you help people to understand or to feel like their opinions count. And the way I do that now is when someone shares a concern or something that's not going well, I say, that's so interesting. Tell me more about that. And so they tell me a little bit more. And then I say, it sounds like what you're saying is, and I try to summarize it back to them to make sure I'm clearly understanding their perspective. Now, even if I don't do anything to change that situation, that person feels heard, they feel like their opinion counts, and that increases their job satisfaction. Of course, if there's something I can do to improve that situation, now I've been given valuable information on what I can do to meaningful, meaningfully make a difference for that person and for their enjoyment of their work. But sometimes there, it's something that I can't do anything about. And in that case, just helping someone to feel heard and understood is really key to in, ensuring their job satisfaction. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of things today. We've talked about what it means to be a leader. We've talked about leadership um, stages. We've talked about job satisfaction. I hope that you found some little bits and pieces in here that are going to be helpful for you, not only as you move into a positional um, role as a leader, but also as you expand your influence and you recognize yourself as a leader right now, right here, right where you're at. If you want more information, please feel free to reach out to me. I love hearing from people. I do have a YouTube channel where I post videos. They're all sorts of different videos because people ask me to speak on different things. So I have a whole series on, um, for example, uh, negotiating for your salary. I have a whole series of videos on that for my YouTube, but I also have a whole series on how to teach swim lessons to kids with autism because that's something else that I specialize in. So feel free to go onto my YouTube account and see if any of those videos will also be helpful for you. Thanks a lot. Bye.